Hi folks and welcome to the short lecture on convertible debt where debt is uh, converted at the investor's option. Um, first of all, just a few words about what convertible debt is. First of all, it allows investors to convert part of their debt into equity. And um, so in other words, what will happen is that you might buy a bond uh, and as an investor and that bond offers you the privilege of converting at your option uh, any part of that bond into uh, common shares. So it's usually the case that investors will pay a premium because they have the option to um, uh, stay with the debt and get the steady stream interest payment and uh, or uh, at their option they can convert into into shares. But uh, first of all, just a few notes. When, when conversion is at the investor's option, the market price of the shares needs to exceed the conversion price in order to motivate them to convert, obviously. Otherwise, why would they convert? So just to give you an example of what we mean here, uh, say for example an investor um, has a thousand dollar bond and each thousand dollar bond is convertible into ten common shares then the conversion price is really a hundred dollars a share right we take the the value of the bond that they bought which is a thousand dollar bond and if it's convertible into ten common shares then it really says that the conversion price is a hundred dollars a share so the shares really have to be worth more than a hundred dollars in order to motivate the uh, investor to convert but we as the issuer we we probably be very happy if they convert because less cash flow out out the door in other words you wouldn't have to pay interest on the bond you wouldn't have to pay the lump sum cash payment at the end if the investors actually converted, so uh, the invest the issuer of the bond never knows uh, whether or not the bond will ever convert either in whole or in part, because it is the case that if the share price doesn't reach the conversion price, then the bond in all likelihood is going to be paid out in cash at maturity. Uh, that's how you retire it, and again along the way you'd be making your steady stream interest payments. So now, um, will conversion in fact happen? Well. How do we know at the issue date if the bond will be converted? Well, the fact is we don't know because we don't know what's going to happen to the market price of the shares. So the outcome of a conversion, i.e. whether you'll convert or not, is really not certain. So therefore, is the bond, do we consider it to be purely debt? Do we consider it to be equity or do we consider it to be both? And in fact, we consider it to be both. So one of the challenges we have as an accountant is to determine how we are going to value the debt piece of the convertible bond and the equity piece. So um, we normally call these convertible securities, hybrid securities or complex financial instruments when the convertible debt um, is, has a, a liability piece which is the bond and the equity piece which would be the conversion rights. So we would record both the value of the debt which is the bond and the equity portion which is called conversion rights and those conversion rights are in fact a contributed capital accounts so or in the shareholders equity section. So they're usually part of other contributed capital. So you've got in, in contributed capital you have two types, right? You have your share capital which is your preferred and your common shares and then you'd have your other contributed capital and the conversion rights would be part of that other contributed capital. So how do we value both the debt and the equity piece? Well the first thing we do is we use a method known as the incremental method and under the incremental method what we do is we say uh, we will value the bonds uh, first and then we will squeeze out the equity portion. So that's how come it's called the incremental method. So the equity piece is really valued as an increment uh, as the difference between the cash that you got for the instrument when you issued it and the carrying value of the bond. So the conversion rights as we said before are really part of contributed capital when the convertible debt is issued. When the convertible debt, or when the when the convertible debt is uh, is actually converted, so when those rights are exercised, then your um, conversion rights really get folded in uh, to the common share account because you're going to debit or reduce those conversion rights and issue the shares. And again, if the uh, rights expire, so in other words, if we get to the end of the term of the bond and there was no conversion that actually took place and, and the bond is just paid out in cash, 
then um, the contributed the rights, uh, the conversion rights, which are part of contributed capital, were never exercised. So we reclassify the conversion rights as expired or lapsed rights, and it's still part of your contributed capital. So that's a little bit of theory, and uh, probably to make it a little more real for you, we can go through a question. So let's have a look at this question, where we have a company that issues 800,000 6% three-year bonds, and that's for 806, and the bonds will pay interest annually at the end of the year. Again, we can see it's convertible at the investor's option, because it can be converted into 60,000 common shares at the investor's option, or repaid in cash, if that's what the investor wants, and the market rate for bonds of a similar term and risk, but that are not convertible, is in the range of 7%. So again, that market rate of 77% is going to help us calculate the portion of the bond that we're going to record as a liability. Remember, we said that under the incremental piece, that's usually the first thing we do. So the first requirement in the question will have us calculate that portion of the liability. So using your calculator... Make sure you set your P slash Y to 1, and we're going to set our future value up at 800,000, and again, plus or minus to make it a negative because it's going to be an outflow. Uh, 48,000 is your cash payment uh, every year. That's your 800,000 times your coupon or your, your uh, stated rate. Your interest rate per year, again, it's a three-year bond, and interest is paid annually, so the number of interest payments is going to be three. So when we... Um, hit compute PV, we're going to get $779,005 and we can see the bond trades at a discount. So therefore, when the entry is made as Nero, Nero is going to make an entry on its books to accept the cash of 806 to record a bond liability at 800000 but this again is the uh, present value of the bond, right? So we know that the discount, if we wanted to calculate the discount at the time that we bought the bond, or we issued the bond, it would be 800000 less 779005 and that would give us the amount of our actual discount, which is 20995 So again, um, that number in here, that's the amount of your discount. We would set that up. And then again, we would set up by squeezing out the value of the con uh, the common share conversion rights, which is 26995 So those rights, again, the value are squeezed out. Okay, and that's again following the incremental method. So now, again, uh, since the bonds aren't converted, we as Nero are going to continue to pay interest. So what would the ex interest expense be over the life of the bond? Well, I just decided to do a table. Um, uh, to to show you what that would be annually for the bond and uh, how we would book that interest expense because um, um Because the uh, issuer, Nero, is going to have to make journal entries to record the discount that's being amortized, book the expense, and make the interest payment. And that's one of the requirements of the question, as you'll see later on. So all I did is set up a, a typical amortization table. I'm sure you've seen many of these before. And again, to get the interest expense, we're going to multiply the book value to open up the uh, one-year period that isn't now ending and multiply that by the market rate for the year which is 7% and we're going to get 54530 the difference between that and the interest paid is going to be the amount of the discount amortized therefore leaving us with unamortized discount on the balance sheet of 14465 and a carrying value of the bonds which is equal to 800000 less 14465 which will give you 785535 and we're going to take that amount, again, that's the carrying value to open up the second period, multiply it by 75% to calc, or 7%, sorry, in order to calculate our interest expense for the period. Moving on, we'll see that we can now use our table to make our journal entries for interest by amortizing the discount, paying out the cash, and booking the interest expense. So we would be looking here in these, this th these three columns every year in order to make our journal entries for interest expense. Now, um, moving on to the next requirement, let's record the maturity of the bond assuming that the shares were issued. So let's assume that at the end of the period, instead of taking the cash payment, the uh, investors decided they've scooped up their interest payments. Now they've decided that at the end they would convert. 
uh, to uh, common shares. So now what would happen? Well, don't forget, when we set this this uh, bond up, we had uh, conversion rights that have never been exercised yet, right? So now at the end of the period when they're being exercised, what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, uh, We're going to debit that account, just on the wrong side of the ledger there. We're going to debit the conversion rights account because we're going to remove them from the books, remove the bonds, and then issue the common shares at what we would call their book value. So this method is called the book value method when you're actually uh, recording the share issue. So you'll notice that when you're recording the conversion rights at the issue date when you're issuing the bond, we calculate the value of those conversion rights using what we call the incremental method. Now if there is an actual conversion and we're issuing the shares, we use what's called the book value method to issue the shares. And notice that those shares aren't being recorded at their market value. Now, if the market value is more, okay, at the time that they convert, then the shareholders can do what they want. They can take their shares and, and, and uh, sell them for cash in the open market, up to them right? Now, let's assume uh, instead of recording at the bond at maturity assuming shares were issued, what if the shares weren't issued? Maybe the market price never exceeded the conversion price, so cash is paid out at the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the bond from the books, okay? Pay out our cash. And don't forget, we had these common share uh, conversion rights here, part of our contributed capital that we recorded at issue date, which were never exercised. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go down here and remove them from the books. But don't forget, part of the amount that these investors paid, part of the premium they paid, was to get these conversion rights. It just so happened that they never, never had the right, the opportunity to um, uh, exercise them. So they've paid for these rights. So when we take them off the books, because we still got money for them, we keep them on the books as contributed capital, but we just reclassify them as lapsed or expired rights. Okay, so they're still still on the books. There's still a section in the contributed capital for them, and it's called lapsed conversion rights, and it's still part of your contributed capital. Okay, so now let's move on to the next requirement in this question. Let's say um, uh, that the bond was repaid after year two before it matured. Uh, so in other words, the... Um, Maybe the issuers of the bond decided that they wanted to take it off the market. Now, because um, uh, exercise was at the investor's option, maybe what they had to do was give them some kind of a sweetener or an inducement to retire the bond at an earlier date. So you can see here that they did pay a little bit more than the face value. In fact, more than the investors initially gave them. They're paying $810,000 to the investors at the end of year two. And 8000 of that amount was allocated to the conversion rights. So the idea here is that because the issuer now has decided that they want to um, uh, um, retire the bonds and they might do that because maybe uh, they might look at it and say hey we're paying six percent a year to these guys could be that the rates have come down um, and they've decided that you know maybe we could be paying less interest so maybe if the price is right we'll get these guys to take the cash payment and then we'll reissue debt with um, uh, lower terms right lower lower interest rates and uh, save some money and maybe they'll issue the debt for a longer period of time we don't know what they'll do but the idea is that certainly investors can do that but investors don't go away lightly if it's at their option in this case we're going to assume they took the deal they accepted the eight hundred and ten thousand dollars so here what you want to do is you want to calculate um, the amount of the unamortized discount now we did do the table earlier so we know that at the end of year two, if we just scroll back up here at the end of year two, we have an amortized discount of 7478. So what we would do is we would remove that from our records, right, as well as the bond. So I've just color coded it here to show that if that's the first step, this is the way, this is the way I do it, by the way, you know, other people do things in different orders. This is the way I process it. You know, I'm going to get rid of the bond and rid of the applicable discount by fully amortizing it. Now, uh, step two, I would say since the conversion rights are not going to be converted because we're taking the bonds off the market, I'm going to remove that whole account. So I'm going to debit 
color coding here. So step is purple. In the entry, it's purple. So I'm getting rid of those conversion rights at 26,995, which was the value at which I set them up. Okay. Now, uh, again, part of this step is also to record is also record the contributed capital on what we call retired conversion rights to remove the rights at their true value based on the cash price paid. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that. We want to make sure that those rights, we know that when we gave our $810,000 out, that part of that 810000 represented 8000 in rights. Well, right now, we've got those rights on our books at 26995 So when we remove them, we want to reflect the fact that they're really only worth $8,000, not 26995 So we take them off if you net out from this uh, original contributed capital on the conversion rights account, the retirement, okay, of those uh, of those conversion options at net, you're getting rid of eight thousand dollars in conversion rights, which is what they're valued at, because that was part of the eight hundred and ten thousand that that uh, Nero gave its investors. So. Now you have this contributed capital in the retirement of the conversion options, which is 18, 18, 995. And again, that's a plug figure. And we calculate it by taking the value that we have the conversion rights on our books at now, less what the rights are really worth. So the difference between the two is the uh, amount, the, the retirement of the conversion option, which is part of your contributed capital. And again, notice that the difference really takes the conversion rights off your books at net at 8,000, which is their, their current value. In step three, we're going to record the cash that's paid for the uh, convertible bond. So therefore, the last step is to plug a gain or loss on the bond repayment. And here, all we're saying is that we have a loss on the bond here. And uh, we get this 802 from taking, basically netting everything out, right? So we've got this um, uh, amount here of 802, which represents the difference between um, this 810,000, right? And we said 8,000 8, 8, of it represented uh, the conversion rights. So 802 has to represent the value of the bond, right? But the book value of the bond in our books was 800,000 less 7483. So if you go back up here, that gives you a book value here of 792,522, right? So that's our book value. So the difference between 802 and 792,522 is going to give you that uh, uh, amount. So again, you can get it just by plugging it, but the calculation here would be your 800, 810,000 less your 8,000, which were conversion rights. So that's basically the market value of the bond or what they had to pay in order to, to retire the bond, right? Uh, less the diff, uh, less the, um, uh, carrying value of the bond. So that'll, uh, get it to us at, uh, 9483. So that handles requirement six, all right, which is retiring the bond, okay, uh, before maturity and paying investors a premium in order to do so. Now, let's look at the last requirement here. Let's say that instead of requirement six, let's say that we're not paying it out early, but what's happening is that, say, investors decided to exercise their option and convert not all but some of the bond holdings into common shares at the beginning of year three or at the end of year two after the interest was paid. So first thing we'd want to do is we'd want to take those bonds off the books, but don't forget they're not matured, so what we need to do is we need to make sure, and we're not taking them all off the books, right? So we want to calculate the present value of the bonds that we're removing. So how much are we removing? Well, we're removing one quarter, 25% of the 800,000, which is 200,000. So I'm going to calculate the present value of those 200,000 bond in bonds by um, uh, using my calculator here. So 200,000 plus minus the future value. So that's the cash outflow. My interest payment that I would uh, that I would be making is 48,000 
times 25% because the 48,000 was the full amount of the payment for $8,000 in bond or 800,000 in bonds but I'm only making a payment on 25%. Now don't forget I have only one period left to go because I'm doing it at the beginning of year 3. It's only a 3 year bond. So instead of plugging in n equals 3, I plug in n equals 1 because that's the length of time we have to go to maturity and again I know my interest rate is 7 for the year. So when I press compute PV, I know that the present value of those 200,000 in bonds that are being retired is 198,131. So the remaining or unamortized discount is 1869. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to have to remove that 1869 from my books along with the 200,000 in bonds and I'm also going to have to calculate the amount of the contributed capital that's uh, on the conversion rights that's coming off the books as well. Well don't forget if I call that step two, I know that the conversion rights when I booked them were at 26995 Well I'm getting rid of 25% of the bonds which means I'm converting 25% of those bonds but I'm also using the rights to do it. So 25% of the value of the rights comes off the books at 6749 Now what I have to do is I need to credit the common shares that I'm going to issue on my book. So I have to give that amount of value. So now if we use the book value method here, because don't forget we're not issuing them at market, we're issuing them based on the value that the investor gave us for the rights. So using the book value method we're going to calculate um, the value of the common shares as the residual. The difference between or the carrying value of the bonds plus the value of the options that we are using up. So we're using up 6749 in the options or the conversion rates and 198,131 we're using that up uh, or that's our uh, carrying value of the bond. So now we're going to get the value of the common shares to equal $204,880. So therefore we would credit the common shares for that amount All right, in step 3. So now You'll also see here that we've removed the bonds at their face value and also removed the unamortized discount because we're not going to be amortizing 25% of that bond anymore. They're coming off the books. We're getting rid of the conversion rights that apply to that 25% of the bond, which is applying to 200000 That's your 6749 And again, credit our common shares for their book value, which is 204880 so this concludes our video on convertible debt being converted, issued and converted at the investor's option.